with that, I'd like to invite our next uh, speaker, Dr. Padmini Balaram. She's a professor at SASI, Creative Institute of Design. And she's, she was the former professor of design and HOD at Shilpa Sadhana Vishwa Bharati Shanti Niket. Uh, Dr. Padmini ji, uh, if I could see you on video. Namaste. Yes. Yeah, hello. Can you Your... see me? Not can fully. You hear me? Uh, I okay. can hear you, but uh -huh. I can't okay. see you fully. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Now, that now was... we can see you. Right. Yeah. 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 So, okay, then I was... is going to speak on demand and influence of the Indian textiles on the world. Welcome, Dr. Balra. Over to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And I will now um, talk to you and I'm sharing the screen. Okay. So, can you see it? Yes. You could make it on full screen mode. Uh, so that yeah, I will do we... that. But if you're kind of, uh, I'm just doing slideshow mode. Yes, perfect. That would be good. Okay. So, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I will be talking to you about uh, demand and influence of printed and printed uh, trade textiles of India on the world. Now, very first uh, photograph that you see is of cheat. And why do we, uh, sorry, and why do we call it as a cheat is because at the background, you can see there are very, very small, small dots. And that was done cheat in Gujarati, it's made in Gujarat. And cheat in Gujarati means uh, sprinklets. I mean, chata we say. So that is, and the background used to be like that for printing colors. And this was found in Japan. And now this next one is the photograph of um, a textile, which is uh, batik resist print, uh, painted and printed using indigo and wax. Um, and that was found in Silk Road route at Nia, which was a station, a halting station in the Taklaman Desert. Uh, and the next one, uh, the other one was of uh, uh, the photograph was uh, is of Jodai Giri textiles. These are the textiles which were made in India for Japanese market. Uh, chins, which is from cheat, the word became chins in. Um, uh, uh, this uh, when the Britishers came, they called it chin, chin, chins. But these are basically kalamkaris. So because they are painted using kalamkari, this talk is now divided into three sections. One is introduction uh, to the painted and printed trade textiles of India, and then it is demand and export of um, uh, early Indian trade textiles, starting from Indus Valley civilization of Indian cottons to various parts in the, of the world and Indian cottons and painted and printed, painted and printed and visit by textiles exported to the um, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, then influence of selected Indian printed, uh, painted and printed textiles of the world is based on literature survey and the field research is done by me. Now I have uh, divided it into different, different sections, which is India to Egypt, India to China, India to Japan, India to Thailand, and uh, uh, many others. So uh, this is the uh, topic selected for this talk, demand to uh, influence of Indian textiles and word, is a topic I came, I uh, in which I will concentrate on textiles of painted and printed. And this is, we say that the fibers which were used during Indus Valley civilization were cotton. So everybody knows about that, but very few people know that even silk was produced at Indus Valley. And we have found the silk, tassa silk was found inside the copper beads of a necklace and um, at the Mohenjo-Daro excavation. And wool and jute and linen were also made. People think linen came from Europe. Uh, so, demand and export of early Indian trade. Uh, in this very civilization trade of Indian cottons to various parts of the world. So, I would like to show you the map. 
and um, this is uh, this is the uh, like map which shows you the uh, routes. Here is the Dola Veda. Here is Lothal in Gujarat, and these are kind of connected. Dola Veda was a port. Right now, it is in the middle of the desert of um, Kutch Desert. Uh, um, and uh, this particular one, it was kind of connected to Sukhtandor, Aladino, Sukhtandor, and then it would, it would go to Umar. I mean, there it's passing through the Persian and the Egyptian um, sea and then going uh, up to the Egypt. So, Dulavira was on the island, and now it is in Kutch Desert, as I said, and Lothal and Kuntasi were in Gujarat. Uh, the other ones, Sukta uh, and uh, 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 this Balakot and all those, they are in uh, and Aladino are now with Pakistan. Now these, uh, which are the uh, countries that they kind of Indian uh, uh, people from Indus Valley uh, communicated with? So they went from Indus Valley. You can see the they passed through these areas and then. Mesopotamia, Egypt were the main things. Persia also they passed through. Uh, and these are the countries that they went. So the very first trade of India was towards the West because Indus Valley civilization was on Arabian Sea and they had direct contact there. So then Dola Vida was 3000 to 1500 BCE and it was an important Indus civilization port. Uh, now it is in desert of Kutch, and you can see how it was at that time because of the um, moving of the rivers and the lands moving. Uh, this area now has become full of all this sea has become full of uh, um, some of this sea has become full of uh, uh, desert. Now this is Lothal, which is the first man-made port of Indus Valley civilization, and you can see in the sketch which is done. Uh, quite clear this thing. It had also the warehouses and um, there are very strong evidences of Lothal doing uh, cotton textile trades and um, it was basically it was uh, exporting many things but uh, um, major export was of Indian cotton and square seas of Indus origin are also found at UR, Kish and Asmel and come, they come from Arcad Arcadian levels. And um, it is, um, I mean, these are the levels when they are kind of doing uh, different, different uh, uh, excavations. It is reasonable to suppose that the Indian ports had direct connect with the Sumerian ports in the Akkadian period, but not in the period after the third dynasty. Then thus it proves that textile exports from India started from the period of Indus Valley civilization. And these are also referred by Moti Chandra and many other uh, very well-known archaeologists. So Indian cottons and painted and printed textiles and there are dyed textiles exported to the West from ancient Indian port, as I said. Now there were three types. One was indigo dyed textiles, which were resist painted or printed. The patterns were resist printed or printed. Then there were resist printed and painted textiles, which were modern dyes. And there were resist painted and printed textiles, which had indigo and modern dye both done on the same fabric. Now I will explain indigo is a natural dye which comes from the plant and the origin house of the, uh, it got its name indigo because of India, because it comes, uh, I mean, its inhabited uh, inhabitation is of uh, India. It is a plant, original plant of India. And then modern dyed textiles. So modern dyeing has kind of metallic, uh, uh, but it was natural metallic ores, which were used to fix the dye. And the natural dyes were fixed with it. Now, influence of Indian dyes and dyeing techniques in, on Indian uh, ancient Egypt. So while talking about the quality of tints and the dyes used, um, Nara and Daji says that chins found in the tombs of royal patrons of Egypt were nevertheless beautifully colored and charming. Most of them have been found to be dyed with safe mm -hmm. flower, uh, that is Kesuro, which we uh, as called in um, Gujarati, and indigo, 
which had surely gone from India, the natural home for the indigo plant. That is, at about 4000 BC, India had been exporting dye stuffs to the countries called cradle of Western civilization. People say Egypt is the Western civilization cradle, and one can see that. Now, these are some of, sorry, one of, um, uh, these are, uh, so, uh, then this is, um, these are some of the samples. Uh, which were excavated from Berenike. Now, Berenike was on the route to the Egyptian, it is a port on Roman port on north coast of Egypt. Now, it was founded in the first half of the century. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it was first half of the fifth century and, uh, and was abundant about 550. DC. So then there is the you can see here in the on the white ground on the white ground there is uh, these dots that you can see these are done by using resist dyeing and the indigo color circles are there and the background is also resist dyed. That's why white ground is there on that fabric. While here a lotus pattern is drawn and you can see the dots of wax in between. And this is Vex dyed, indigo dyed, Vex painted and indigo dyed textile with lotus pattern. These have gone and uh, they could find out that whether they also had to do a test to know whether it was Indian or it was something made there. Now that was kind of done by this test said that these were made in Indian because the twist of the yarn is different uh, when it is made in um, uh, um in uh, Europe side and uh, Central Asia side, while in India it is different twist. So from the twist, they could make out that this is the kind of this fabric had gone from India. And these are the textiles which were excavated at Fustat, which is very close to Cairo, and they have three four types of varieties, and many of them were sent from Gujarat. And you can see that uh, white area was wax dyed, wax painted. I mean, sorry, wax painted or wax printed in case of this. There were blocks also used for printing wax, which you can see in the central indigo dyed um, textile, which is uh, blocks are used. And uh, then after uh, applying wax with the block, it would be dyed in indigo wax. And these were usually underground indigo wax. And um, these are dyed using medar, and this is dyed using indigo. Last one on the right at the bottom is dyed using indigo, madar. And in madar also they have two colors, more brownish purple and the deeper uh, red and the other red. And so they have two, three shades of reds and blues. Also two, three shades are there. Now this is, so that kind of ex, uh, advanced uh, printing things uh, were already existing during early years of uh, before the centuries started. And then evidence of cottons inside in copper beads excavated at Merga uh, was found. And that is 7000 BCE. So cotton was already cultivated in Merga. That was the first place to where cotton was cultivated and then made into thread. And you can see how thin the, the, the diameter Average diameter was 1.18 mm and the holes were even smaller. So drill holes range from 0 0.43 to 2.3 mm depending upon the size of the beads. And this is the Ravi phase of, um, of the um, uh, Indus Valley civilization. And the native cotton thread was found from these beads. See, normally cotton, which is very perishable item, so to find cotton and textile materials from the excavations is very, very difficult. So these have survived, these threads have survived because they were inside the beads. So because of that, the beads took the, uh, I mean, they sustained because there are some are, uh, I mean, some are copper beads and various kind of beads were there. So some are bone beads, some are different, different types of materials were used. So some are like stone beads, a peak or something like that. So um, uh, they kind of uh, 
preserve the thread. That's why we could get that textile samples. This is Mohanjodaro. Uh, and a well-equipped bias workshop was excavated at Mohenjo-Daro. A cotton fragment preserved in a silver vase from uh, Mohenjo-Daro, carbon dated to 1760 BCE, plus and minus um, 115 years, uh, has been reported to show evidence of Medar dying. And these are kind of uh, uh, Marshall who had kind of excavated uh, Mohenjo-Daro and which um, also, Dr. Lal, who was part of it, they have kind of written. And this is modern dyeing in India. Uh, so this is the yarn that was kind of, uh, that was a cloth, I mean, uh, fiber of the cloth, small piece of cloth that was, uh, uh, then it was tested. And when it was tested, the, ra it, the red dye, this particular cloth had red and purple colors. So the red and purple using meda dyeing technique is um, used over there. So now modern dyeing technique actually. Uh, so the uh, Medar is um, uh, Manjishta in Sanskrit. And uh, this is a root which gives very good red color and India was very well known for it. And in South India, the best Medar came from Madurai. Then more modern dyeing technique gilded fast colors and to the cotton. And cotton is the most difficult fiber to dye. Uh, same dye would be very bright on silk or um, wool, and it would be much faster to dye than cotton. So, and this I'm telling you also from my experience because I do, um, uh, nat I use natural dyes myself. Uh, so, and I dye them, dye use the clothes using them. So finding purple colored cotton fragment proves that the modern dyeing technique, which is a very complex and advanced dyeing technique involving knowledge of chemical properties of various modems and their chemical reactions to different natural dyes was already known to Indus Valley people. Uh, a well-known historian, late Dr. Lothika Vardarajan also had said, had the same opinion and she has mentioned in India, a fragment of modern dyed cotton fiber has been found in Mohenjo-Daro, and this is a clear indication of antiquity of modern dyeing in India. Uh, now, a uh, famous Japanese research scholar has uh, mentioned uh, and uh, collector, and he himself also was, was a dyer, Yoshioka Sachio san, uh, he said that in first century CE, when the world could not dye cotton, could dye cottons only in indigo brown and dull yellow, the technology to dye cotton cloth in red, purple, and other beautiful colors had evolved in India. It is astonishing to realize that, that at this time in history, a chemical process already had been developed and was widely employed. Now, he did not know that this process had actually been, uh, had started in India from more in, uh, Indus Valley civilization time. Uh, I met this person and is very knowledgeable and has written several books in Japanese uh, and also had a workshop of natural dyes. The sample shown in previous slide proves India had already mastered modern dyeing techniques during Indus Valley civilization. In summary, it's, uh, I will just say that textiles of industry for during Mohenjo-Daro, brightly colored cotton cloth was a desirable item, which uh, since few people at that time knew how to grow cotton. So people of Indus Valley civilization traded with Afghanistan, Persia, Dakkan, Plato, and were carrying out far distance sea trade with Mesopotamia, Sumer, etc. So Indus Valley trade was at its peak between 2600 BCE and continued until 1800 BCE. Esper Narayan painted and printed textiles from India, which later came to know to be known as chins or kalamkari, were one of the earliest Indian textiles found abroad. This I and mean, this is this one tradition which has started from Indus Valley and is still continuing. So these are very rare textiles that we can find. That is, I mean, it's still preserved. And this ancient text, uh, technique is still practiced in India. Uh, I mean, is one of the traditional techniques 
with the longest life still surviving in the world. So influence of selected Indian painted and printed uh, textiles on the world based on the, uh, this is based on my uh, literature survey and field research in some of these countries. So the reference to the flowered cottons of India started from Mauryan Empire. These textiles, which are modern dyed, were called flowered cottons of India uh, because they are referred in Chinese um, uh, text and Chinese people have written them as Ma, uh, Wa Mian Pu. Wa in Chinese means flower, Mian means cotton, Pu is um, fabric. So that is how Chinese have referred. So it, they are called flowered cottons of India. And uh, that was the earlier name. The Greek physicians, uh, physician Senia, uh, uh, Cesias, uh, in 400 BC writes about flowered cotton emblazed uh, with glowing colors, which reminds us of modern uh, modern chins, much coveted by fair Persian women in the harem of Susa and Ekabana. And there are several references to that, then Mekanese, and these are some of the ref earlier references. The Greek 300 BC sent an ambassador to the court of Chandragupta at his capital, Patliputra, now Patna. While writing about his visit, the ambassador says, the contrast to the general sim simplicity of, of their lives, the Indian love finery and ornaments, their robes are worked in gold and ornamented with precious stones, and they were also flowered garments made of the finest muslins. Very fine muslins were made at that time. And exports and impact of Indian painted and printed cottons on the world. And the muslins, I would like to say that even um, Buddha's body was wrapped in muslin, muslin very fine muslin. Uh, there is one more story about muslin. When uh, Aurangzeb, a kind of a, once Aurangzeb was sitting in his court and his daughter came and he shouted at his daughter saying that go back and wear clothes properly and come. Um, so his daughter said, but I am wearing 12 layers of muslin. And in spite of wearing 12 layers of muslin, it was the muslins are so thin and transparent that it was kind of been seen, the body was being seen. So demand of, uh, that is the kind of quality of muslin. It was also called, muslin was also called as woven air because it was like air, you could hardly see it. Sometimes um, like uh, when it is put on dews or something, you can't see it on the glass if you put it. So some demand of Indian textiles in the world. Indian textiles were considered precious. Indian textiles were paid in gold were used by kings, royal families, nobles, etc. Hence, in many countries, they were copied for making it affordable for the general public who desired to possess them. In 16th century CE, they were used as a currency for spice trade. When Portuguese and British, etc., went to, I mean, they had come to in search of Indian route and they wanted to come to India for textiles for indigo and for the spices because all spice uh, trade was in India's hand. Uh, so the spices they needed to keep their meat longer and not let it get spoiled and for the taste. And then the, they wanted now to capture their, uh, that spice trade and they went with their red woolens to the to barter because at that time more barter system was going on and nobody was willing to buy them. And they said get Patan, Patola, or Chins from India, Kalamkaris, and then we will barter. So that's how they started so-called factory, which will actually warehouses where they then started also keeping militaries and made forts, and then tried capturing our um, cities and uh, kingdoms. They were collected to free ones. I mean, th this is very amazing that the chins and the Indian textiles were piled up and they were collected 
to free oneself from capture by pirates or imprisonment. Like if somebody was caught by pirates, they will ask for their equal height of Indian textiles, a pile of Indian textiles as high as your own height. So uh, then India to Egypt, as discussed in the previous section, is is already discussed in the, in the previous section. Uh, uh, so I will go to the India to China now. So Indian media, I call it media because they were made from wax and they were many of them were made in Gujarat where mir means wax and media are the textiles which are made using wax as a resist. So, but they were called batik in Indonesia. So today, the batik word has become very famous all over the world. And all the wax printed textiles are called batik. So because of that, what happens is people, even the website, such as if you go to a very well-known website, something like I've even found it in BBC or some other websites, they all say batik was kind of uh, uh, from uh, started from Indonesia. While we have this batik, which has gone to China much, much before Indonesia. It has gone on the uh, this road. Indonesian first uh, batik from Indonesia, uh, which was actually painted and printed in India, was excavated, is dated 5th century CE. And uh, afterwards, they started copying it and then it was made there. So same, uh, this is Chinese batik, which is of seventh century, eighth century, and same kind of uh, elephant, which is in black and white is Chinese. And here, this is found in Sosho in collection of Nara, which is of Nara Jidai, that is Nara period, eighth century CE. And Sosho in collection is a very huge collection preserved very well. I have seen it in at least four or five times. And uh, this is Indian painted and printed tints made especially for the Chinese market. Later became very popular as chinoseries in Europe. And you can see this lady, Chinese lady is dressing. And here is the circular way. And these are some of the chins. This is a palampur. Palampur, the word palampur came from palang poch, again a Gujarati word. Palang means bed and poch is the cover. So the bed cover. India, they, they were also sometimes hung on the wall. India to Japan. Now, Rukyus were the first, Rukyuans were the first to bring Indian textiles to Japan. Now, who are Rukyuans? Rukyuans are the people who stayed in present Okinawa Islands. It was at that time separate kingdom called Ryukyu Kingdom. And they, in the 14th century CE, Okinawans were the first uh, sent the uh, 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 Okinawans first sent the mission to Chinese emperor and followed it up by sending it to eight other ports of Southeast Asia from where they acquired Indian textiles. Indian textiles didn't go to Japan directly. They went via these ports and they further exported it to Japan. So this is the time when they started having Indian textiles. After reaching India, Portuguese were the first Europeans to reach Japan with Indian textiles in early 17th century CE. After the closing of uh, Japan, because Portuguese started converting the Japanese to Christianity, so the Japan closed all the doors and uh, they allowed only few Chinese traders and also Dutch traders. They gave only one island, I've been there, Nejima Island, to trade from. It is a very small island and which continued till 19th century CE. The Europeans sold Indian textiles at exorbitant prices to Japanese, which gave birth to production of Va Sarasa in Japan. Va means uh, Japanese, Va is the old name of Japan, and Sarasa is uh, painted and printed textiles. Now there is also one, uh, this thing, because when Portuguese came, they called these textiles as Saraso. Now, where did this word Saraso came? Saraso came because they were bought in Gujarat and Gujarat Saras is excellent. 
So they, I think, misunderstood and they thought the name of that textile was Saraso. When the Gujarati traded must have said that the both Saras chair, you know, this is, this is excellent quality fabric. So Indian chins used for Jodaigiri textiles. When Indian chins reached Japan, they were so expensive, the people couldn't buy an entire thang, that is yardage. So this is a rare, first is a rare, sorry, a rare uh, kind of a kosode, Japanese kosode. Kosode means short uh, sleeve dress of a prince who could afford it to buy the entire piece and make the entire piece. Rest were, I will show you some of them, were quite uh, different. And small pieces, uh, so the fan was cut into small pieces and small pieces were used for Jodai Gire. Uh, these are Jodai Gire textiles. Jodai Gire means very precious textiles. They were, the tea ceremony also came at that time in Japan. And uh, these are for the tea ceremony. These are the bags made for the tea ceremony, utensils and boxes. Uh, and that is precious textiles. Uh, so use of Indian chins depicted in Japanese painting. This is the geisha wearing Japan in the red circular dress is from Indian chins. Now, as I said, because they had collected several pieces of Indian this thing, these are the kind of dresses made. And in this left hand side, the fabric rent shorts or some things in center is the fabric which is made by Japanese uh, people by painting it. And here there are all pieces stitched, stitched together to make the dress. Now, textiles especially made for Japanese market in India. India was excellent in making uh, textiles from for different, different markets and the designs and the color combinations therefore. Here, these are Tomoe design with three comma, which is supposed to be auspicious. Open fan is auspicious and given as a gift to um, people who are starting new business. Open fan means get prosperity. Then there is also this uh, design of uh, um, he hexagon. Now hexagon design represents turtle shell. And as turtle has a long life, anybody who is getting is getting born or is as a birthday, it is given as a wrapping cloth. And uh, uh, the gifts are wrapped in the cloth. And these were called wrapping cloths. And then these are, so these are some of them. Now men, these textiles were very expensive and these are you can see some different different patches designs and this is like a temple design so the stumpal this came from influence of indonesia too because from you know, temple design went from india to indonesia and indonesia to japan these textiles must have come uh, the last two ones uh, then the uh, Illustrated when they wanted, then they wanted to make these textiles themselves because they were so expensive, so the common people couldn't afford it. So these manuals were printed where Indian textiles designs are copied in Japanese, every color, where to put which color is written, and how to make these colors are written. And these are some of the pages from those manuals. And then these are copies of Indian chins made in Japan and developed of Vasarasa based on Indian chins. And Indian chins were, these two are, first two are on the left hand side, Indian chins, Vex resist, modern diet, give deep and fast colors. Vasarasa, you can see that the same colors are more pale, uh, stencil printed and gives subdued and fugitive colors. India to Thailand. Indian chins and Kalamkari expected to see an island. And it is so amazing. I've written one more article and uh, given presentation where the whole wall is uh, painted in this um, uh, temple, uh, this golden temple uh, where there is a, this uh, golden statue of uh, Buddha is there. Uh, and that whole wall has Ramayana scenes all painted and everybody is wearing Indian chins in their paintings. And then this is uh, uh, Indian Kalamkari, which spread to Siam. And you can see this chint, this thing also, which I told you. And the, for royal use of gold was painted over it. And many times this one, um, uh, 
were later on kind of also exported to Japan. Uh, and the design sometimes were sent by um, uh, Japanese. So they were called uh, Samu Sarasa and they were also sent to Japan. So Japan bought Indo Sarasa as well as Samu Sarasa later on. So um, uh, import of Saudagiri to Siam. Now Saudagiri is a cheaper quality of Indian hand painted uh, Kalam Kari's, but Saudagiri's were block printed. Blocks were made in Pethapur and they were block printed on coarser cotton at Ahmedabad, Gujarat for Siamese market, catering to common Siamese. Mm. Siamese later made Samu Sarasa to sell Japan. And you can see this design and their Muscati is written, which was a company. Muscati is written in English as well as Gujarati. And that was, a, and also Thai. And that was the company ordered this Saudagiri and sold it in this thing. Then India to Indonesia. These are the, uh, this is a Hansa design, which is, one can see over the centuries, the fashion remains same. Unlike this fashion, which are so pretty, that every three months you have to change the fashion and the throw away the clothes and make all the dump yard. And also use, they use all used chemical dyes spoiling our earth and the water. And these are healthy natural dyes. And this is, you can see for the Red Sea trade, Fustat Egypt was produced. These were, uh, this work recovered from Fustat in Egypt and they were produced in Gujarat for this Red Sea trade. And this is cotton fragment of Hansa and Lotus design block printed found at Fustat Egypt. And there was another one was from Indonesia. This is from Indonesia. This is in 1510 CE. So they are same designs went to various countries. Now the X resist was very important. So, and that gave birth to Batik of Indonesia. As I said, even the websites, many, many so called authentic websites also said that the X resist was started in Indonesia and Batik, just because the word Batik is used everywhere. That's why I insist on using word Minya. So, this is fifth, uh, there are first phase, it was in India. And it was kind of a uh, first period, Egypt and India. I mean, basically it was in India, then went to Egypt. And then it was between the areas of Egypt and, uh, um, Egypt and uh, India. So that is 5000 BC to first AD. And then later on, if you see Indonesia, it has reached only in third and fourth period, eight to 15th century. India Malacca trade. China also it had reached, but it was it had reached late. The second phase miss uh, China Sui Dynasty 581 and 618, and Japan 581 to 618. So Nara period and Heian period. And uh, shoulder cloth from Java, copy of a Patan Patola in Batik for common public. Patan Patola, which are resist dyed textiles, which are made in silk were very expensive and could be used only by royal families and nobles. Uh, so in Indonesia, a, a common people could only use it on their wedding day because they are considered to be like king and queen on that day. They are given that status in Indonesia. And um, uh, But to wear it every day, they wanted the same designs. They copied it and made it using X resist, which like they already had this... Uh, uh, these things and symbols of uh, mythology of Indian batiks are based on in Hindu mythology. This is Garuda, and you can see how it is designed and placed in Indian batik. This is uh, a batik made for Indonesian market. As you can see, the design is quite different. The combinations are different. As I said, the uh, India made different different kind of textiles for each market. And also made for Muslim market at the same Masuli Patnam and uh, uh, Gujarat, and uh, uh, they were they were for Muslim market. It was prayer mats that were made. So then a batik from Sirebon displaying combination of Indian and Chinese influence with layout like religious alamkari of India. And here it is a vyala which is multi, uh, like vyala having a tongue. I mean. 
I mean, elephant and uh, like there are birds also and lion also. It's a mixed animal. So that is also concept here. Now it is surprising. I was in Shantini Ketan teaching and they, they told me Shantini and my department was the one who started Batik there, Shilpa Sadhana. And uh, we had Batik department and we were teaching Batik. So then I, uh, I said that, um, uh, and they told me that the uh, Batik and Shantini Ketan started after Rathindranath Tagore, that is the, uh, Ravindranath Tagore's son, went there. Uh, to uh, um, Indonesia and learned it and brought it. So I said, Are, so close by. Uh, Masuli Patnam was the great center of Bharti. Why did they have to go all the way to Indonesia to uh, do that? And I kept asking everybody. So why did they go all the way there to get Bharti and not here? So then they said that basically they had gone there and they saw it and they thought it was good. But they changed things quite a bit. They didn't copy it exactly the same. Now, this is one innovation. Uh, the purpose of Shilpa Sadhana was to give employment to the rural people. And rural, uh, rural people uh, 100 years ago didn't have electricity. So in this hurricane lantern, they have made attachment on the top to put a teacup, stainless steel teacup, in which you can put wax and heat it and dye it, make it there. So that is like, he is painting, so Arikan Lenten also is on, and this also can. Um, at night, normally ladies get time, so they can use it both ways. Then Indian chains made for Europe. Later, mechanical copies were made. So this is the Indian chain made for European market. You can see quite different tree of life design has changed quite differently. A Palampur again, Palangapur, a word of, uh, I mean, um, English version. Uh, of the word Palampoch, bed cover or wall hanging made in 1720 to 1740 for Western market. Indian chains copied in Europe and printed in machines. And then this was done to cut and not only chains, many textiles were copied in uh, uh, British and other this thing as soon as they started this mechanization and they started industrialization. And they wanted to take over Indian markets. So they, using this, they cut all Indian markets because they, they could sell it very cheap. While well, Indian works were done by hand, taken more time, and people had to be fed. And this is the reason. Not only that, they started flooding Indian markets. They produced 10 copies of a set of volumes. Um, um, and which were supplied to British manufacturers to reflect, replicate all Indian textiles on machines to support industrialization. They started selling these textiles uh, even within Indian markets, taking away jobs of Indian craftspeople. This made Gandhiji to start burning of foreign goods and production of khadi in India to give work to craftspeople of India. Now, the conclusion importance of India in the world of textiles. India was most famous for its fine cotton muslin, exquisite motifs and patterns, vast and brilliant colors. Apart from cotton, India also produced kasa, silk, jute, linen, etc. from India's very civilization. And flower cottons of mm -hmm. India, i.e. painted and printed kalamkari, have enjoyed the longest export starting from India's very civilization to present day due to its brilliant and fast colors and excellent designs. Indian traditional knowledge needs to be documented before it disappears. Experimenting needs to be encouraged. Publication, conducting workshops and holding exhibitions could help reviving um, a tradition and taking it further. For example, this particular fabric was made by me uh, using natural dyes and that is, um, um, in 1979, and nothing is faded. My indigo dyed dupattas, nothing is faded in spite of uh, um, uh, made in 1979, even today is as brilliant as ever, washed in washing machine with heavy detergents. And people say natural dyes fade, which is fake. If you don't know how to do it, everything will fade. So, and this is one of my painting, which is also uh, done using natural indigo and using bex. So I also practice, so I understand the technology uh, 
little more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Balaram. I like the fact that you ended your presentation by saying I also practice. And it is the practitioner aspect, I'm sure, is something that actually lends uh, sustainable credibility to actually so many things that we speak about. Uh, that was a well-illustrated presentation and you managed to do it within your 45 minutes as well. So thank you for keeping time and maintaining time.